And uh, welcome to the Virginia Festival of the Book. We are, uh, my name is John Lohman. I uh, am the director of the Virginia Folklife Program, which is uh, at the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. And uh, we are very, very proud at the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities of our, of our book festival. And uh, we appreciate all of you for all your support, coming out, um, and uh, all of the reading that we all do here in Charlottesville and supporting all the local bookstores and booksellers and this, uh, this wonderful event. And as you know, this event goes through Sunday. And uh, please uh, catch as many of these programs as you can. And, uh, and in fact, uh, those of you who are, I'm going to have you turn your phones off or down or on vibrate or whatever to kind of not bother folks. But those of you who are tweeters out there, uh, you can always tweet about this event. Tell people to come now with a hashtag VA Book 2017. If any of you are tweeters, I don't know how to do that, but some of you, some of you might. Um, I also, you see, you've been given those uh, those fluorescent yellow. Uh, uh, evaluation forms and it also gives you a ch us a chance if you'd like if, to give us your contact information so we can keep you abreast of all the things we do at the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities and uh, we do read those by the way so um, please do that um, and there's also um, as you know this is mostly a free festival most of the events are free um, it is certainly not free to put on we bring hundreds of authors here it's quite an event um, and uh, I think it's okay to say that if you have been following the news a little bit, you also know uh, that uh, uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, as well as many other important organizations, are on the, on the hit list, as they say. Um, and so there are several ways you can support this festival. One is uh, if you would like to make a contribution, uh, you can get on the website, vabook.org, and we would certainly appreciate that. Um, also, uh, on our website, at the Virginia Humanities, uh, dot org, uh, we make it very, very easy for you to contact your legislators. Legislators, um, it's amazingly easy, actually. In fact, I did it. They actually call you. It's very strange. You click something and they call you. And a real person you can talk to um, about the importance of the National Endowment for the Humanities, which um, we would not exist largely without them. So. Uh, very, very important right now. Um, and then I just want to mention that at the end of the program, all three of these books will be for sale, and the authors will be here to talk to you and sign anything that you would like. Um, so I, uh, I, I wanted to first just uh, quickly introduce all, all four of our authors here, um, and then I'm going to just make a comment or two, and, and then we'll hear from our first author. Um, sitting next to me is actually a old friend of mine. He's a, uh, a kind of my counterpart, I guess, in uh, my colleague and counterpart in the state of Indiana. I, I'm considered the state folklorist of Virginia. I don't know if you knew you had one, but that, that's me. Uh, and, uh, and John Kay, who's here, has that role in the state of Indiana. And Everyone has to be named John if you have that. Position. Yes, without, <laughs> without an H, too. It's very, it's, it's amazing. Uh, and he is the author of uh, this new wonderful book, Folk Art and Aging, Life Story Objects and Their Makers. He's a professor of practice at Indiana University. He directs, as I said, the Traditional Arts Indiana, which is a statewide folk arts program, which received a 2013 Governor's Arts Award. You could talk to your legislators about the NEA as well, by the way. In 2013, he received an Archie Green Fellowship from the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. He also lectures on a wide range of topics related to folk art and material culture. For example, folk art and aging, but also gravestones in southern Indiana and researching historic photographs. Prior to working at Indiana, Kay directed the Florida Folk Festival, one of the oldest and largest state-produced folk life festivals in the United States. Um, on the far end here, I'm sorry, I'm jumping over there, is, is Neil Snydow. And Neil, and Neil is the author of Vista Del Mar, A Memoir of the Ordinary. And he earned a BA in English from the University of California at Riverside and an MA uh, from here at University of Virginia. And he's a retired community college teacher living in Magalia? How do you pronounce that? Magalia. Magalia, California. 
And uh, he titled uh, the book Vista Del Mar after the street he and his parents first moved to in Redondo, a bright, as it says in the book, breeze, or on your website, a bright, breeze-filled and solitary place in Southern California where, as one of his favorite writers puts it, the light breaks hearts. Um, and then um, we also have here, and this is a, another amazing book, uh, Teresa, is it Kubasak or mm-hmm. Kubasak and Gabe Huck? And um, I, there's lots to say about them, and I just say a word or two uh, from their book. And um, in about the authors, it says Teresa's life so far and Gabe's life so far, which I like very much and is kind of fitting in a way for this panel. Um, Teresa um, has put together uh, literacy, arts, and social justice into 40 years of teaching from Hoover Street School in Los Angeles to Roll, Colorado, and then Chicago and New York, and then on to Damascus, which is what this, her, her and Gabe's memoir is about. Uh, she wrote curriculum for the Woody Guthrie Archives, and she's proud to say she dropped out of a PhD program in 2001 to become more active with an organization called Neighbors for Peace. And I think you'll tell a little bit more about yourself. <laughs> and uh, Gabe's life so far uh, is that he attended Benedictine schools where he learned from one monk what literature is and another why we challenge power, he says. He was a monk himself for four years, um, uh, but in 1965 caught a bus to Washington via Selma. He's a conscientious objector, council CEOs. Um, we can go on and on, uh, but uh, we'll hear more about it. <laughs> Gabe as well. Um, I, I just want to say before we start, I got an email from Neil, I guess it was a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, and he said, you know, I don't know if I'm on the right panel. I don't know how my book <laughs> fits in with these other books. And, um, and in fact, uh, you know, sometimes you have panels, I've been moderating panels for a long time, Sometimes you have panels where it makes you know immediate sense. They're all cookbooks or something like that. Uh, something with like this, it's very hard because there really are. These are totally three. I don't know if there are any other books like these books. I don't know what you would pair these books with necessarily. Um, the um, the program, the book festival did the best they could, calling it a memoir as art place. And I think that's a good title. I think all three books, as you'll see, certainly um, touch on art. I mean, John's book is directly about art and its role in uh, folk art and its important role and potential in the aging process. Um, And I think that uh, Teresa and Gabe's book, um, while it's not directly about art, so much of it is about the art and the beauty uh, that they encountered um, in in Syria, in Damascus, as well as in Iraq. Um, And then uh, Neil's book is itself a work of art. It's about a project. Uh, that he did uh, taking photographs, making photographs uh, in his in his hometown. Uh, memoir, I think, covers most of it. I, uh, I don't know that John's book would necessarily be called a memoir. Memory, maybe, is a better way to put it. All of these books are very, very much about memory. Um, uh, John's uh, directly, as you'll see, um, about uh, the importance of memory. Um, Neil, of course, you know, returns to his hometown, which um, you know, as all of us who return to hometowns probably have experienced, uh, you know, the places are there, uh, the storefronts are there, the house you grew up in is there, but of course it's not there. Uh, it's, a, it's a different place. So, uh, you know, memory exists around us all the time. And then um, Rebecca, uh, Teresa and Gabe's book, of course, is a memoir. It's about memories, but um, uh, sadly, it's also a lot about history, as, as we're talking about sadly places many of these places that they write about and the beauty of them uh, are very very different places now uh, with all that has happened in that part of the world um so you know i just want to say that uh, i consider it always a, a privilege and a honor to get to read these books because uh i wouldn't have maybe encountered the mothers and they're all three wonderful books so let's uh let's start here and welcome uh, john k here please thank you Maybe we can go ahead. Yeah, that's great. Glad that John uh, introduced it that way. I kind of felt like I was having that nightmare where you you uh, wake up and you're supposed to be taking a test that you haven't shown up to the class for. Uh, calling my book uh, uh, a memoir is uh, is a little bit of a stretch, but in another way, it's kind of a meta memoir. It's really a book about. Uh, my exploration of the creative lives of older adults 
and the memoir, material forms of memoir that they, they make. And I'll tell you a little bit about uh, that work. But first, I've studied and researched uh, in my work as a folklorist uh, traditional arts from Kentucky, Virginia, Tennessee, Florida, Indiana, where I grew up, and now where I'm the state folklorist. I basically had spent my life documenting traditional arts, but one of the things that I discovered really quite late, it seems like, uh, was the fact that the people that I interviewed were sometimes among the oldest people in a community. They were the keepers of traditional knowledge. They were the people who knew how to make things. They knew the significance of those things uh, and worked to uh, try to keep their community together, either through music or through stories or through craft. Uh, and so it seemed kind of odd to me that it really wasn't until about uh, six or seven years ago that I really started thinking about what does the art making practice, I know what the elders do for their communities as far as traditional artists and, and craftspeople, uh, but what does craft actually do for them as older adults? And it really kind of led me down this path of really thinking about how I would like to, to, to grow old and the things that I would like to incorporate in my life and made me rethink uh, a lot of uh, how we age in the United States and uh, what's working and what's not working. Uh, my book is basically structured uh, uh, in seven chapters, but five of those chapters are stories of people. Uh, they're stories of elders that I've bumped into along my, my work. Uh, my, our, our dean uh, at the Indiana University came up and asked me, how did you find these people? And I said to him, I've spent my whole life finding these people. My problem is not finding the people that do this type of stuff. My problem is deciding which five I wanted to write about. Uh, and these were people that made a very special type of art. Uh, I could have done it about fiddlers. I could have done it about basket makers. I could have done it in a whole variety of ways. But what I chose to do is to focus on this very narrow subset of things that are called life story objects or life story art. Uh, and these are things that are created uh, to basically to recall, to remember, to share uh, a person's life history. This is my friend Bob Taylor. lives just uh, a few miles from me, actually. Uh, and this is a, um, a wood carving. In almost photographic detail, it recalls a story of uh, a whale that came to Columbus, Indiana on the bed of a, of a rail car. Uh, it was pulled in there. It started in California and was trucked through the Great Depression, uh, all through little towns all over uh, the United States. And it pulled into Columbus, Indiana. They set up a tent around it. Uh, and he, uh, uh, he wanted to remember that. He was eight years old when that happened. And he remembered it, but he didn't remember all of it. And so he went around and he started talking to his friends and researching newspaper articles. And so his memory of it then became very augmented by other people's memories and community members' memories and newspaper. And it turned into a whole year-long process of researching this carving. And then another year of carving this piece. The whole time that he's researching it, he's going out into his community and he's talking to people. Uh, he's making social connections with people. The whole time that he's carving it, he's staying very active at mentally thinking about what's going on in his life. And it really gives him purpose. It gives him a reason uh, for the work uh, that he does in his life. Uh, and I saw those same factors happening over and over and over again with the artists that I worked with. People like Marianne Sykes, uh, she makes hooked rugs. Uh, and she grew up in Chicago, lived, uh, lives in northern Indiana. And um, she makes these hooked rugs that tell the stories, not of her own childhood, but of when uh, her, she was actually raised in an orphanage, a kind of abusive uh, situation. And she doesn't want to remember that. She says, I, uh, I may be 200 years old and I'll, I'll probably never uh, make a rug about those years. But these are about the years when her own children were small and she can remember them. Uh, and she hooks these rugs. Another person will spend six months to a year thinking about and designing, uh, recalling, sketching, re-sketching. And then another six months to a year 
hooking these rugs so that she can take them down to the local rug hooking club that she's a member of. They like to call themselves hookers. Uh, so the, the hookers in Chesterton, they, they hate it when I talk about that. Uh, but they, uh, they come together and, uh, and she has something. She's become a celebrity in their community, at, though she's well into her 90s now. Uh, she has this thing that has given her a sense of purpose and place in her life uh, that she had never had before, although she had been artistically active her whole life. My son made a big igloo with his friend, and they had a little dog. They put it at the top, and it would run out the bottom. It was one of these little mousy dogs. They called him mousy. And my daughter Barbara was selling two snowballs for five cents so they could throw. But uh, kids were playing snowballs, hitting everybody. And there's the, the street. And the police were called several times for the for the igloo on the ground. <laughs> the kids were noisy. That's where we lived. That's where I raised the kids. Right. These were cold water flats, they called them. So this was the one I owned with the red door. They were narrow buildings, 19 feet wide, 60 feet long. And you raised your kids. It was miserable. Very narrow steps, you know. So she has uh, has this memory of when her kids were uh, kids were little that she wants to recall. She lives in a very rural part of uh, northern Indiana. Uh, she sees her, one of her sons maybe once a week. The others she hardly ever gets to see. She hears from them on the phone. But this is a, lo- a, a method by which she transports her thoughts and her memories back to that while still connecting socially with her community uh, there in Chesterton and staying uh, very creatively vibrant. Now to look at these, a lot of art historians and stuff will look at these types of works and think of them as works of art, and they are works of art. I mean, both Bob and Marianne are are exemplar artists, but they're communication tools as well. Uh, You could see they were intended to be narrated. They were intended to be stories that were told, and it's not that the stories make sense of, of the rug or the rug makes sense of the story they're mutually created and they're intended to go together uh, to make that person a vital part of that community uh and one of the examples of that is the red door and i said well why was your door red oh my door wasn't red she said uh i said well why is it red well that way i can tell people where it was that i lived uh because it's hanging up on the wall and she didn't want to get up and tell people so she's she's able to narrate it so they're intended to be those narratives. Uh, this is uh, Gus Potoff, and Gus was a, a survivor of the death camps of Burma, helped build bridge on the River Kwai. He's one of the chapters in there, volunteers weekly. Uh, actually, he, he just passed away about a month ago, uh, was 96 years old. Uh, but for 30 years, volunteered at a veterans museum uh, in town, and he would have a painting uh, on the wall uh, so he could tell his story. He has a thick accent, he's Dutch Indonesian. Uh, really a, a vibrant person. I'm going to move real quickly because I'm running out of time. But uh, each one of his paintings tells a very specific story. Uh, and his whole mission is to make sure that people remember. They want it to rem- uh, people to remember those, uh, that, what happened there. Uh, and he calls it his work, the work that he does. So he has this whole second life uh, that he does. I could tell you about lots of people like John Schoolman, the walking stick maker that's a chapter, or Milano Passage, a Serbian instrument maker that I write about, or broom makers, or tractor repairmen, all, all different types of things. But uh, the, the takeaways from the book is that these types of art making practices are very common. But if we think about creative aging in the United States, one of the things that, um, that we come up against is it's really about art being won't go through each one of those. Um, It's really about art being added to people's lives. But all of these artists, art becomes an everyday practice for them. And that's what I wanted to try to highlight. Uh, I was doing a talk at a library in St. Louis uh, a few weeks ago, and someone came up to me and they said, "Uh, but what if we don't have art in our life? Uh, And I said to them, well, and she was nearing, I'm nearing retirement and I don't have art in my life. And I said, 
It would be the same thing I would tell someone who's getting close to retirement and they don't have any savings for their retirement. You have to invest in yourself if you want to be able to have a quality of life later. Uh, so now is the time to start, uh, wherever you are, to start investing in your, your creative practice. I don't care what, I mean, what your, it could be cooking, it could be craft, it could be music, it could be a whole storytelling, a whole variety of things. Uh, but one of the takeaways I wanted to share with everyone is uh, we all need the arts, uh, as John was saying, uh, with uh, the threats to our things. But more importantly, we need the arts in our daily life. Not something special, not something elite, but something that we do as an ongoing practice. So thank you all. So I thought maybe we'd go down to Neil uh, Snyder there and uh, Vista Del Mar, a memoir of the ordinary. That is it. Uh, do I need a controller for the... Nah. I've got some... Hi, everyone. I've got some slides to show. Thank you so much. They will appear, I'm sure, magically as they did for John. And just, <laughs> and I have faith. I have faith. Oh, there he is. There he is right there. Uh, good. Good afternoon, everybody. It's just lovely to be here, and thank you so much for coming. This is this is wonderful. Um, at readings out in California, where I'm from, uh, I'm, I'm not used to having to turn my head, you know, to catch everybody in the room. Usually, there's just a tiny, tiny group. So this is really exciting for me, and I, I hope I don't swivel too much as I'm speaking to you. Um, my book is more like a memoir, kind of a classic one. There we go. Okay. Oh yeah. All right. Um, uh, I started writing it in the mid-1990s. It's really been took, took quite a long time. I was a person who uh, uh, wanted to write very much. I, I uh, started, you know, kind of writing creatively here at uh, UVA in the, uh, when I was a, a graduate student. And uh, I was sort of shaggy and existential and, you know, smoked unfiltered cigarettes. Oh, my God. You know, it was just, uh, it was 1971. What can I say? And... Uh, <laughs> You know, I lived in a trailer in Earliesville, and they, and I, it was the one you'd walk in, and you'd kind of felt like you're on, you know, it's a ride up and down. They hadn't quite shimmed up the the bedroom end, so um, it, it was sort of a, a hand to mouth existence. And I would drive in here and attend classes with these, wow, extremely distinguished professors, and and sit and grumble existentially, and uh, wait for the cigarette break when I could smoke another uh, horrible, horrible, you know. Uh, camel or whatever so uh, it's been a long time since I've been back and life has smoothed out considerably since then you'll be glad to know uh, but even back then thank you for laughing Drew. I want you uh, even I appreciate that even back then you know I really wanted to write so I was very ambitious and so I went back to I was raised in Southern California but my dad uh, was from Virginia, and so we even have a highway marker, for heaven's sakes, and it's not Shoney's. I just want to put that out there. But anyway, uh, we have a highway, highway marker in Giles County where uh, an ancestor of mine ran a ferry across the New River. We used to giggle about that Snyder's Ferry. That's great. you know. But, but when I got to the New River and looked at how wide it was and thought, wow, I have an ancestor who took responsibility for getting people and animals across this vast expanse of, of flood, especially in the springtime, I was impressed. So uh, always Virginia was a deep, deep, you know, part of the weave for me. And my dad, I think, when he was shaken loose, like so many people of his generation, came of age in the Depression and came west to work in uh, aircraft plants. And so liked Los Angeles, liked the weather, uh, what's not to like, you know, in 1945 in L.A. And... Uh, uh, moved to the beach there, and, and that's kind of, we, we started life in Virginia and then moved to the Midwest where my mother had a home, uh, and then we came out to California in the early 1950s. So all my upbringing, there was a presence, a deep presence, not only of objects in the house and, you know, antique things, and, and but there are also my dad's accent and my dad's relative, you know, my, my lovely aunts and uncles from Virginia, and they had their fabulous uh, southwestern uh, Virginia accents and would tease each other about their their you know southernisms in their in their conversations and and so this was a powerful uh, element in life. Later on, or I think perpetually, but later on, I began to notice that my dad grieved about this lost place, and we would always make you know pilgrimages with him back to Giles County, down at Pembroke, you know, a little little east of Blacksburg. 
we would go down there and visit. And of course, there was all these there were deep roots. And he began, to, I think his, his life in Southern California was lovely, wonderful. He had a grand time. And yet, he never quite got over leaving behind you know, this place. And, and uh, a family uh, association had drawn little, uh, had pictures drawn of the old homestead, which was a, a, a cabin. Because uh, these people got there in the 1760s down the wagon road, you know, all these, all this stuff. New River Valley settlers. So my dad would sit in our little den in Redondo Beach uh, in our, in the house he'd paid I think 17,500 for, um, and uh, on an FHA loan in 1950, you know, six or seven. And one day he was kind of in his late 60s, and I was visiting, and he said, "Well, here I sit in his barca lounger, you know, with the kind of the shag carpet, all that." And he and he leaned back and said, "Here I sit," and he had his little picture from his family association up on the wall. He said, "Here I just sit and I look at the old place, and I just get old." Well, so there was a kind of grief uh, about that, and uh, I think it began to uh, move and infect. Uh, my writing, uh, maybe in fact is a poor word, <laughs> inform, okay, let's put it that way, and began to inform my writing. I was very ambitious. I wrote a novel. Of course, it was a terrible first novel, aren't they all, unless you're really, really, you know, brilliant. And then I wrote a second novel, which really should have been a good novel, but was not and took me, I could never finish it. And so I generally, I was just a person kind of lost in their middle years. Some of you may know people somewhat like that. And uh, spun wheels, if we, for this is, my book is for the people who are spinning wheels uh, in their lives. And so finally, my wife and I were in the middle of a really difficult thing. We were trying to have a baby, and this was not happening. So if, if you have been ever known anyone who has spun wheels in that regard, this is kind of how it began. I'm just going to quickly do the first, first paragraph, and then I'm going to take us to a little tiny moment with my dad. And I'm just going to read these two paragraphs, and then we're going to talk about these pictures that are up here because picture making was part of the book, and I can hold up my, I taught for years and years, and I'm used to holding up stuff and showing people, you know, here, students, okay, so you guys get that. In 1996, I began to make pictures of my hometown in Southern California. A beach town, it offered photogenic attractions like sunsets and views, but these weren't what drew me. Instead, I chose as my subjects details of the suburbia in which I had grown up, apartment facades, backyards, bits of parks and schools, as well as odd anonymous objects, railings, fences, electric meters. Like my subjects, practically invisible myself in my middle-aged pursuits, I photographed these methodically from a tripod onto black and white film, a wordless man bent over the camera, framing images of a retaining wall or ground littered with eucalyptus leaves. And I will pass on that if you are looking for a, to be conferred a kind of invisibility, get yourself a camera on a tripod. Nobody will pay any attention to you. I'm not kidding. Anyway, so this kind of began, and, and I, I'm pointing out that um, it began in a kind of season of grief. My wife and I had just lost a very, very uh, expensive in vitro pregnancy, and the whole project kind of began, began in the season of you know great sadness. And I began to make photographs of my old hometown, even though at that time we lived in Northern California. As I photographed, I began to realize I wanted to go to other places, other locales that were important to my family. So. Along the way, and I really had no sense of where this would ever go, but it's, I seem to be writing to accompany the taking of these pictures in ways that finally, after years of writing, you know, unsuccessfully, maybe joylessly, uh, began to be rewarding for me. I sort of found a voice, which writers will understand is a, such a powerful thing. I'm sure many of you do that yourself. And so I, I went back to Virginia and took pictures, and I find, and I sort of chased around where my family had been. I went to Lincoln, Nebraska and took pictures. I went to Shreveport, Louisiana to take pictures where my, my mother's uh, and her first husband, uh, who passed away in the first, Second World War, uh, had been stationed in the 1943, and, of, and Galveston, where my dad had worked as an 18-year-old fella. In their family in Giles, uh, women went to college, Radford. Boys worked, period. That was kind of how it went. And so my dad at 18 uh, found himself, uh, graduated from high school, Pembroke High, class of 36, 18 people you know, in it, and uh, was down in Galveston running a coffee shop uh, in a hotel uh, where a local rich person you know, would go to come back to Giles and hire people and take them down there. So he and his brothers worked. Um, so the presence of Virginia began to be important, and I 
got to a little passage here, and I was remembering this. I was sitting in a, as I was sort of visiting uh, Giles County one visit and making uh, images down there and getting re recontacted with cousins who are still there. Uh, this memory came to mind, and I will just share it, and then I will talk through these things, and John will just shut me off when I go too long. But this is just one paragraph, and this is when we used to have, in Redondo, it would be a Christmas time or an Easter, some special occasion, and the Holy of Holies would arrive in the mail. This was a smoked Virginia ham, okay? <laughs> O-M-G, all right, this was the biggest thing going. It didn't matter what kind of, you know, I don't, these were not, as I point out, some of these were not giant slabs of, you know, Hormel you know, laid down over your plate. This was the real McCoy. This had been made by some little farm up where somewhere in the in a holler, in a glen, in a, you know, in a canyon, in a cavern, and uh, uh, it was a huge thing, so this is, this is what happened. At last, on a special occasion, Father would take down the dead body of his lost Virginia life and cradling it carefully, carry it into the kitchen. There, peeled of its burlap and laved in brine, it would be washed clean of surface mold. And I can't find this lot. It's gray-green patina of smokehouse age. Brow furrowed, even looking a little petulant, Father would lovingly work his hands over the mottled surface of the ham until its dark heartwood color began to emerge, while in the meantime, Mother and Nancy, my mother, of course, and aunt, cooed an unending uh, worshipful chorus of exclamations and yes sirs to ratify this coming to life of the past. Next, the ham would be sliced, first with a serrated carver, and then on a finer scale with a paring knife, father's hands in a flurry of work along the pale, emerging surface of bone. Here were no hulking, factory-bred slabs of pink meat to hang over either side of a plate. The meat on these animals of secret holler and mountaintop was elusive, knotted, dense, and tight to the bone. Father's knife worked into crannies and fissures, winkling out scraps of meat the color of Virginia red dirt and new bulldozed driveways. These were slipped into a smoking pan, fried and turned in a hot spatter, and then around the table the unending chorus of exclamations and satisfactions still raining about Father's scowling face like spring petals, his quick muttered grace, pardon our sins and save us, Christ's sake, amen. The meat reluctantly, parsimoniously, worshipfully parceled out on biscuits to be choked down in silence like grief itself, salty, hot, and tough. Okay? So, so, so that was kind of very important to, my, to me, you know, to sort of remember that, that strain of life. Now, the, the, the armature of the story that I'm telling is actually the adoption of our lovely daughter who turns 20 in a month. And uh, so, the, we, you know, this is, there's a, a hopeful arc to this story, but there was a lot of stuff to wrap around that armature along the way. So I th just brought these photographs along. Thought you all, and please feel free to uh, uh, exclaim or shout out any uh, thoughts that you have regarding these, and I will invite my fellow panelists and, and our uh, moderator to, to go along as well. Maybe, uh, what do I do? To press the button and then uh, something will happen? No, okay. Is it the top? Up on the right? To the right. To the right. Oh, the, I'm sorry, duh, okay. Boy, where did my, okay, well I didn't put captions on there, yeah, it's all right. So this is my, on the, and on, on the far uh, left is my uh, grandfather's barn in Pembroke, Virginia. And on the right is my mother's back wall uh, on uh, Helbert Avenue in Redondo Beach, California. And, in, and my sense of these uh, images, which were both in the book and which sort of captivated me, is a, a sense of a, a kind of... Uh, First of all, all the images are unpopulated. I sort of needed no people. There are a few snapshots in the book, but I kind of wanted place. Early on in the book, I say what I was looking for, and I'm a lit teacher, and so the phrase from the Aeneid, the tears of things, you know, that, that, that um, was, was an important one for me. Virgil and coins uh, as um, Aeneas is looking at the story of the Trojan War on a mural, and he, he realizes the the lacrima rerum, you know, these sort of things that have a kind of numinous quality, a sort of sense of grief a little bit, even though they do describe the banal, and, and, and there they are. So both of these uh, kind of images sum up the way I was, I was approaching these, 
get a sense of what's going on. Here's another. So on the left is Cumbie's store on uh, uh, Little Stony Creek Road in Pembroke, Virginia. And this is a store that uh, herds of college students are taken to and uh, shock the owner by coming in and taking pictures because it's so un unspoiled. It's, a, it's even early mid-century, you know, kind of by mid-century meaning 30s and 40s, and it has all these lovely ads and things. So I went there and tormented the poor man myself and took pictures, and he was terribly lovely as people are down there. But this is a, these are a couple of sunbeam bread decals. And then on the other side, this is a, a, a part right across from the apartment where I grew up. This is on a window on Comité de la Costa Avenue in Redondo Beach. We're one block from the Pacific Ocean at the, the other end of the continent. And both these things. I said at one point uh, in the book, I, I was drawn to, I call these voyeurs locales. I was sort of drawn to windows and, and views in where actually the view is obscured. Uh, you that, and, and you start to notice the actual uh, things, things that are defending against time and change and penetration are sort of there themselves being abraded by time. So th this was a couple of others that I paired together. Let's see what else we got. So this is my grandfather's porch uh, over here on the far left. Sears Roebuck off the train, off the off the train car, uh, pre World War One, uh, uh, Pembroke, Virginia. Uh, taken down. This is prefabbed, taken down, and I have you know sort of numinous early three-year-old awesome memories of thunderstorms and things viewed from this mythic you know <laughs> little space. And I'm not sure why I'm so big on scuppers, but I'm really big on scuppers. Do you notice that's the black thing there? That's not a mail slot. That's a that's something to let you sweep you know rain. <laughs> And then this is uh, on the Esplanade in Redondo Beach. This is looking right at the ocean, 1710 Esplanade. And this, you notice the kind of Philip, the kind of uh, Charles Neutra uh, mid-century stuff. Tell me when. Am I ready? Pretty, pretty, pretty quick. Okay. Let me run through the rest of these. Okay. Uh, Tuggle Gap Motel, Floyd County, um, and then a, a, another uh, apartment. I have to say that in nowhere in southwestern Los Angeles County is there a place called Tuggle. Okay, so I know that this one is Virginia. I'm just teasing. Okay, anyway, there's that. Um, Winchester, Virginia, Old Town, and then a vacant lot in my neighborhood in southern in Redondo. I titled this Pittosporum and Dumpster. Okay, that is the one. And uh, finally, these Virginia woods always remind me of the Civil War. These posted woods that in March they're naked and. And then over here, this is the beach ramp down. This is the ramp down to the beach, and uh, in Redondo, and whether I call this um, ice plant and rebar. Okay, so th th there they are, and I think that's it. Oh, one more. Okay, and there's that nice one from Shenandoah Valley, and then the apartment next door, mm -hmm. and that is the one. So my journey uh, was uh, in uh, east-west, back and forth. And uh, thanks so much for listening, you guys. So, Thank you. Nice. Okay, and finally here we have Teresa Kubasak and Gabe Huck. Never can I write of Damascus when Syria became our home. Okay, thank you. Um, we are the, the newcomers to Virginia. We moved from New York City to Harrisonburg last August. And it's delightful that there is such a thing as a festival of the book that we can come to here and take part in and that, that, uh, that you folks make it happen. Our story, uh, the part we tell in this book is, begins in the late 1990s when we were, were living in Chicago and became more and more involved in uh, our awareness of what was going on after five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years of the harshest sanctions ever imposed on any country on Iraq after the uh, invasion in uh, 1991. And we joined up with a group of people who were involved in breaking those sanctions, going to Iraq, visiting hospitals and schools and people in their daily lives and seeing the harm that was being done uh, to, the, to the culture, to the education system, to the nutrition, to the health of the people of Iraq and came back to talk about it wherever anybody would listen to us. Um, we did that four times. 
before the U.S. shock and awe in 2003 uh, invaded and uh, occupied Iraq. And then we wondered what to do next. And we were both retired by two years later. We moved to Damascus, Syria, where more than a million Iraqis had uh, come as refugees, uh, virtually no questions asked, just admitted and uh, allowed to find safety there. And we thought, well, if there's anything we're to do, if there's any reparation we're to make to the people of Iraq as Americans, let's go there and see what we can do. We'd never been to, to Syria before. We moved there, we lived in the old city, and we stayed seven years. Uh, and our, our work in that time became each year for five of those years, the last five, to prepare uh, young Iraqis who now were unable to continue in college uh, and had good spoken English to work a full year with us, somewhere from eight to 20 each of those five years. And, and in the course of that year, daily study of, of the academic English they would need for U.S. college admission, finding scholarships uh, over, over here, and all of the rigmarole of, of getting visas and, and so on. That, that was the work until 2012, uh, which was about 16 months after the violence began in, in Syria. And uh, I want to read one, a couple of paragraphs from the book about kind of our daily life in Damascus those years. Our Damascus is life in the, on the streets. It is shopkeepers sitting alone or in pairs or groups, always a steaming pot of tea nearby, some sort of gas or electric device. It is men playing backgammon with or without an audience, crowds of children off to school and home from school. It is the sellers of street food on corners and the sounds of them calling out to come see what they have as they go through the lanes on bicycles with carts behind or with a donkey pulling the cart. Ears of corn boiling away in a kettle nestled in their cart or perhaps the amazing banana on flat bread garnished with tahini and chocolate sauce and a variety of other toppings, or the cold mulberry juice. Life on Damascus streets is the processions to the cemetery and the public mourning tent near the home. It is the one-man tea service that comes right to your park bench. It is the sellers of books and posters outside the university and the souks selling vegetables and fruit just in from the Ghouta area, where the, the fertile part east of Damascus, or two dozen kinds of olives from the Dead Cities area southwest of Aleppo. It is near professional skateboarders zooming past on the sidewalk. It is the man selling hot fool from a great stove on wheels, beans cooking with olive oil and lemon and sprinkled with sumac. It is the homeless cats, and all of them are homeless, who share their city with us. It is coming round a corner, and stopping short because you realize you came around that corner three minutes ago and how did you get back here again? It is for one long season each year, the sight and full fragrance of jasmine, the city's widely and wildly growing flower. It is the men in their rolling garbage cans who pick up after all of us. And until we left Damascus, it was still possible to walk those streets without any trepidation, any hour of day or night. Thank you. You can tell we love Damascus. I feel smiling just hearing that description of how it was for us. And I, I echo John when he says, make sure people remember. And we want you to remember how, how our Damascus is. And, um, as Neil says, framing images and the images that we have in our book. We didn't want to write this book, and we, we kept not writing it. We came back in 2012 from Damascus. But a friend who lives in Damascus who is Syrian with a son in Brooklyn and a daughter in Cleveland said, you have to write this book. You know us. We are in your country, and we look at the television. 
we listen to the radio, we look at the headlines in the newspaper, your people don't know who Syrians are. Write this book. The country that you love is our home. <sighs> so we wrote this book. And um, it was based actually on letters that we wrote every month during the seven years to people back here to tell them how, how our life in Syria was. But we didn't take the letters to become the book. Our publisher said, no, make it a memoir. And so we divided the chapters into four sections based on the four areas that we lived in. The first area we lived in was the old city of Damascus. Later we moved to the Palestinian area that had started as a camp in 1948. Then we moved to an area called Sahat Arnus that was more um, working class apartment kind of buildings. And then the last place that we lived was a little bit up the mountain um, up from Damascus called Jezer Abiyad. And then in the book, we placed photos, not the kind of photos that you might see today about Syria, but photos of people selling olives, people coming to school, people sitting on their porches there. And the photos are by the person who advised us to write this book. You'll also find two recipes because, you know, as the ham is to Virginia, hummus and frike are to Syria, and you'll be able to cook those foods. And one thing we did was um, get sidebars. Some are historical to tell you more about Syria in the past, and some are very current. So our very first Arabic teacher, Hussein, was writing what it's like there today. So although our narrative is telling you in the past how we lived there, you could read Hussein saying, yes, but now if you go to that same place to buy tomatoes, here's what it's like. So you have that balance in our book. The acknowledgments we did based on a quilt that we purchased in Syria, and you might think, wait a minute, Indiana, Virginia, folk life, quilts. This quilt is from Bosra in Syria. And so the acknowledgments, if you look at the back of our book, are based on the, uh, this quilt. And in the, in the part that's not applique, in the muslin section, you'll see names of people that we want to thank in our book. Not by name, but by category. Teachers who worked with us, people who drove the bus with us, children, people who made the bread that we ate. So we bring this as a touchstone, as as John talks about in his book, A Touchstone of Syria, to us. The part that I want to read is about the hammam. The hammam is the public bath. And every Sunday after church, I would go to the hammam for a great scrub and massage. And it's a wonderful part of, of history in the Middle East. Um Mustafa was excited when nonviolent demonstrations broke out in Damascus in 2011. She wanted wider job opportunities for herself and her two brothers, all college graduates. She wanted a better educational system for her son, and she wanted economic growth in Syria. But she added, I love our president. My son would die for him. As the violence in Syria escalated, the early morning chatter in the hammam became more serious. In a letter that Gabe and I wrote to friends and family in July 2011, I described my impressions at the time. The women who work at the hammam weep for Syria, for all the dead, for the disruption of normal life, and they support their president in every way. They most clearly distrust the hand of the United States in all of this, in its call for U.S. citizens to leave Syria in its constant use of sanctions against Syria, in the blustering of Hillary and Barak and others against Bashar, in its support of Israel and its butting into the affairs of Syria. They are well informed about the role of the United States in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the US role in Israel. They said, we know that in the United States, you have people who sleep under bridges and people who can't get health care as if to say, solve your problems at your home and don't meddle here. When my 60th birthday arrived, I celebrated it first thing in the morning at the hammam. I bought a huge watermelon to float in the fountain where it would stay cool for later in the afternoon. 
I brought fresh chocolate croissants from the nearby bakery to go with our coffee. In conversation, turned to our ages, and Hannah laughed at me, saying, What a baby. You're only 60? In late fall 2011, our beloved Damascus was affected by sons of gunfire and explosions. Um Mustafa was angry one morning and said to me, What makes your country think you can tell us what to do? Do you think we don't know and hurt for what's happening in Syria? Why can't they keep out of it and let us fix our own Syria? By 2012, no music was playing in the hammam, and the women spoke in sad voices. Instead of gossip and jokes, the conversation was more often than not about Al Midan, a neighborhood southwest of the old city, and about the violence the previous night, or Kutsaya, one of the many neighborhoods up the mountain. Sometimes they discussed the many people coming into Damascus to escape from Holmes or Hama. A few weeks later, Um Mustafa lamented, we are just pawns in this chess game. The French, the United States, Saudi, Russia, everybody is acting like it's their country to decide. No one cares about us. As the academic year of Iraqi student project began to wind down, I told Um Mustafa that Gabe and I would be leaving at the end of August and not returning. Um Mustafa bitterly predicted, in some years, you will return to this hammam. None of us will be here. And you will say, Allah irham hon, God rest their souls. We have uh, time for questions, uh, comments uh, from the audience. Uh, no one has one right away. I could kick things off with one, I guess. I, I, uh, Tracy talked about uh, sort of responsibility that you ultimately felt to, to write the book um, as a way to kind of tell the story. I'm wondering about uh, John and Neil, if you kind of felt the same impulse. You know, these folks were doing this art to carry on their story, but maybe your role as a folklorist or as an author of this book to kind of, did you feel responsibility, I guess? You know, what, what drove you to write the book? Maybe it's a good way to put it. Uh, I, I would have to say, yes, there was a, there was a strong sense of, of people, you know, I've, I've often over the years working as a folklorist, I'm sure you've experienced that, where you show up to someone's house and they go, I've been waiting my whole life for you to show up so you could record oh. There's stories. I remember a fiddler in eastern Kentucky. I showed up and, and he said that to me. Um, and here I found people who were already recording their own stories visually. Uh, and what they wanted me to do was to try to share it with a wider audience, especially my friend uh, Gustav Pada, who was Dutch Indonesian, survived the death camps of Burma. And uh, he had this strategy where he would give paintings away. He never sold any of his paintings. Uh, and so he gave them away. And he would always tell you, tell people the story. Tell people the story. And he just kept saying that over and over again. Uh, and so when I came time to write my book, I, I tried to do it in such a way that uh, there's like a PDF version that uh, I'm able to give away through, for free through the press or... Uh, try to find ways to make sure that it spreads uh, really well because I think these people have important stories as individuals to tell, but I think collectively their story is also very important to share. Uh, you know, when I started, I, I bet there are people here who are writing uh, memoir. It's, it's pretty common, and we all have that impulse to sort of get things down. When it, when it began, it was much more inexpressive, and I'm a, I probably would say a therapeutic sort of exercise for myself that slowly uh, turned into something I thought a, another reader, you know, readers might, might want to read. But in surveying it now all done, uh, I'm really quite conscious of how much what we might call lore, history, uh, fact, um, uh, studies of artifacts that are in our families, 
Um, I have an uncle who, um, well, he passed on, but uh, his his military career was uh, amazing, and he was. We I don't know too many people who were in three wars. He was in uh, uh, saw action in World War II and Korea and and Vietnam. Um, so you know was was witness to astonishing things and. Uh, he was not communicative to his family. I think I'm the one in some ways who knows, you know, sort of a few more things maybe than he passed on to folks who are my cousins. And I got to write them up and include them in a chapter because the Second World War influenced me very much. So it is in retrospect, it is interesting how you do have this kind of uh, uh, stewardship of the past, you know, I guess I would put it that way. Yeah. sort of a combination comment question for Neil. Are you familiar with Georgia O'Keeffe's paintings of barns? Yes, ma'am, I am. From Lake George, the ones in New York? I don't know yeah. where they were from. I have yeah. one in my home. Oh, I see. Uh, or, you know, a copy of it, a print of it. Um, and your work reminds me of that. So huh. I felt there was a connection somehow. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to borrow from really good people. That's yeah. yeah you're, you always want to be inspired by the right ones. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Teresa and Gabe. Um, just curious about how you're carrying Syria now with all the great sorrow and and just this was such an important place that you invested in and how you carry that now. Mm. How do we carry the sorrow of Syria? Whoa. <sighs> How do we carry? Hmm. Well, in, in our own um, lives, we did not immediately find, have a way to do that. And what it has turned into a bit now, four year, for almost five years after we left, uh, has been do, trying to do for, for with Syrian students who are refugees now um, th this kind of effort to get them into good colleges because in general when they've gone somewhere as a refugee it is it, 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 like Syria provided through high school for all the Iraqis who came there but after that you're kind of on your own and and the, the, we're working with six, just six students last year who are refugees in Istanbul from Syria. And through the whole year, only we weren't there. We found volunteers, first language English people to work with them. And, and Teresa worked on Skype every week with them. And six of them came to colleges in the US last fall. And we're working with another six. but not for U.S. colleges at this point. I mean, we were until January 30th or whenever the first ban was tried. And so now we're working with Canadian colleges. And that's a loss to the U.S. I would say, too, if you come to our home in Harrisonburg, we have things from Syria that are present to us. And we drink tea with cardamom, and we have things like this quilt we showed you, or this I carry with me from a Syrian friend who gave it to me. And I like to wear things from Syria. So if someone says, oh, those are cute earrings, it, I say they're from Damascus. And then it gives me a chance to talk with people about the people that we love in Syria. And we try to communicate with those that we can by email. And as Gabe says, working with the refugees now that are in Turkey, that's been very rewarding. and. They're happy that we're here today with you as well. We have other questions from the audience. Yes, um, we have a send a mic down to you here so it gets recorded and. Uh, this question is for John. Do you, the folks that you've spoken to, are they trying to, yeah, it's on. it is, I'm just soft spoken, sorry. Um, are they trying to get younger folks interested in the art that they create so they can continue it? 
I'll repeat that just for those. He was asking about are some of the artists, uh, uh, the folks that John uh, works with, if they are making efforts to teach these crafts to younger folks and get them interested in. When I uh, uh, when I called the book folk art, uh, I was uh, kind of bracketing off a very special type of art in this. Uh, as a folklorist, we tend to police the boundaries and it's traditional arts and it passes from generation to generation. There are traditional aspects of all of the things that are here, but the, that wasn't necessarily the main focus for many of them. Through my work with Traditional Arts Indiana, I, c I could write a whole, and, and I'm actually working on that right now, uh, a whole other book that's about uh, traditional arts and aging and about the idea of elder artists looking for apprentices and sometimes they find them and sometimes they don't uh, so I think that that's a very uh, very good concern or good uh, good observation uh, this is really looking for someone to share a story with more than about passing on the technique yes we got a mic coming to, microphone coming to you yeah for Teresa and Gabe, I'm wondering, I'm assuming you maybe have current contacts, current contact with people in Syria, so I'm wondering a little bit about what you learned from them at this time. Okay, and the first thing I should say, because this is such a short time today, that tonight we'll be at the Quaker Meeting House in Charlottesville, and it will be a longer time where we can address some of those issues of how the people in Syria, what are they telling us now, and so this flyer will be on the table in the book, on the book table with the address and um, for the event at the Quaker House at 6.30 tonight. But um, we hear from people and it's interesting because the two teachers that work at the Learning Center in Damascus still are teaching English and their Spanish and German being taught at that language center and there's still a library of books there where students are coming to learn. Another family we know, only the father is still there near the old city. All four of their children have dispersed, one in China, two in Spain, one in Turkey. Some people, we have not heard much where a daughter said, our family is fine, mom and dad are fine. It's very hard economically. My sister and her husband and child moved in with us. Can you get me out of Syria? Can you help me? So there's, you know, and we hear from Hussein not as frequently as a writer. Do you want to add to that, Gabe, what we hear from people in Syria? Yeah. Um, Damascus is mainly what, what we are in touch with by email, uh, uh, friends there. And um, beyond that, not so much. And, of course, Damascus has not suffered the kind of destruction. It certainly suffered a kind, some other kind of destruction, but not the way that Aleppo uh, and, uh, and other uh, Hama and Homs early on did. So to, you know, to, to stay in touch, but it, what is remarkable for the people there is they go on. I mean, it's, it was hard when we left five years ago and they go on. So much, you know, so much has changed. There was water in very short supply much of the past six months. Now it seems to be better. But that the, I, I think a lot of the, uh, the, the suffering we've all, we've all seen in so many ways of transmission, what we haven't all tried to do, I think, is, is to ponder our responsibility, to ponder the responsibility of other powers in the world for for what has gone on there, and to ask them, like like the woman in the hammam said to, to Teresa, you know, we're we're nothing, you know, the, the Saudi and and Qatar and Russia and the U.S. and Turkey are playing their taking it out here, and of course the the the, the multiplication of militias and the, the tactics that they use has gone on since that time that that, that we were there. But th these are people with 
a history, for heaven's sakes. Damascus is probably the oldest continuously occupied city in the world. 4,000 years of people living there. And, and if, if we pay attention, Christians or Jews, to their scriptures, and, and certainly Muslims also, it, these are places where the stories happened. And we, you know, I, we would never, I don't say those things because I ever would want the U.S. to intervene militarily in any more ways than it's doing right now, and not even those. But we sat there in that first year and said, no, we won't come to those meetings if, if you let uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad uh, still be in his place. Well, that isn't the way it's done, folks. It's never been the way it's done. But those talks that Kofi Annan and others was trying to put together didn't, went nowhere because the U.S. was not willing to say, we'll talk to anybody, just let's stop this before it gets worse. And it got so, so, so much worse. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. We have one in the center there. Question? Thank you. Um, I'm just curious, uh, when the folks say they love their president, um, what are the things they love about him? I can only say that the passage referred to 2011 when she said that. And I think as things evolve in 2012 and beyond, I don't know what she would say today, nor have I heard from her. So I can't answer that. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the moderator, um, John mentioned a website that um, at the beginning or even before the program, I believe, that we could perhaps contact in order to speak up about the uh, cuts or elimination even of humanities funding for programs such as this. Could you mention that one more time, please? Sure. Well, there, there's, uh, there are many out there, actually. Ours is, um, is the Virginia Humanities, which is uh, the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities website. Um, slash advocate. And I think if you just go to, if you Google Virginia Foundation for Man, we'll, we'll get you there. Um, and it's very, it's actually very easy. Um, hopefully it's effective, um, but it's, it's very easy. Um, the National Humanities Alliance, NHA, which is a, a group to support the uh, humanities across the country, um, I've used theirs, and that's fantastic. That's that's the one I used where uh, you actually just put in your address, and um, you actually get a phone call, like a minute later, that that uh, what's the word puts you right through to your your congressman instantly. It was it was uh, amazing, and then you talk to somebody, and you, you share your feelings. So. Um, but thank you for that. I did want to, since I uh, have a moment, to give actually a plug, responding to your question about the apprenticeships, about teaching. Um, at the, here, at, at, well, most state uh, folk life programs have an uh, apprenticeship program. Ours is funded by the National Endowment for the Arts, um, and uh, it has been for 14 years. And um, we've paired masters and apprentices in the widest range of uh, traditional art forms you could think of. And every year we welcome a new group in and kind of graduate those that finished um, in a, at a free, wonderful showcase, Folk Life Apprenticeship Showcase. I don't know if anyone's ever been to this event. There you go. <laughs> uh, it's a wonderful event. Uh, last year we moved it to James Monroe's Highland, which is formerly known as Ashlawn Highland, um, out there on uh, Route 15, right off Route 15. Just to let you know, it is Sunday, the 7th of May. It's a free event, and we feed you, and you hear incredible music and crafts. Uh, Sunday from noon to 5, our apprenticeship showcase. So I really recommend you. We'd love to see you there. And I don't know if we have any. Yes, we have May 7th, Sunday. Okay, yeah, and there's a ton of signs for... Uh, for James Monroe's Highland, uh, you know, you pass Monticello and keep going. If you've never been up there, it's uh, beautiful grounds up there. Uh, 
Yeah. Well, I think we are we are right there at the end. Um, you know, the authors, many of them come from a long way. Uh, happy to say that Teresa and Gabe are no longer coming from a long way, but many come from a long way, and they. Uh, we have these books, and uh, I know you want to pace yourselves, maybe, because I know there's a lots of books, but um, this is such a wonderful part of it that you get to actually uh, purchase the book here, read these books. They're all amazing, and, uh, and, and you get to have them signed, and you get to talk to the authors. So we really hope that you'll do that and help support uh, this, this great work. So once again, I want to thank John Kay and Neil Snydow and Teresa Kubasek and Gabe Huck, and thank all of you very much. For and Teresa.